Well, everybody that's on, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us here. I think we got a, a pretty cool presentation to uh, to show you. Um, for those that haven't used GoToMeeting before, I'm not going to go through all, all the slides. I think most people have at, at this point in time, but um, there's obviously three of us that will be on here today. So feel free to, to drop questions in the chat. Whoever's uh, not talking will be monitoring it. And um, I guess Terrence and Scott, feel free to interrupt me if I'm uh, presenting. And there's a good question that comes up if it's relevant for for that point in time. Absolutely, and vice versa. <laughs> yep, cool. sure. So with that, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. So I guess uh, to, to kick this off, this is a, you know, medical device focus. We kind of uh, chatted between the, the three of us here and picked a model, we chose a syringe. Um, so we're gonna walk through uh, playing a couple of different roles here. I'm gonna be the designer. I'm gonna mainly work in uh, SolidWorks, not a ton of CAD work, but where you know the focus of the presentation is showing how the different pieces of software integrate with each other and how you can really achieve that single source of truth um, by using all of the products together in kind of a, a seamless working environment. So I work as a designer, do a bit in SolidWorks. We'll show some uh, pretty cool features in, in PDM. Uh, then we'll hand it off. I'll kick it over to Terrence. Um, we'll do some simulation. I'll let you introduce yourself, Terrence. Uh, yeah. So. Uh... I'm Terrence, and I'll be playing the role of the, the simulation engineer uh, in this project. So, um, you know, Andy sent this over to me. I ran his simulation, um, you know, went through some design iteration. And so I'll talk about, you know, how that works with the other products, how that integrates with uh, PDM. Uh, and we'll we'll get into some simulation details as well. And then we'll, we'll kick that back to you, Andy. So, yeah, don't want to ruin it, but uh, you know, on that on that first sim, it was definitely not what I was expecting. Would have been uh, yeah, me neither. Def yeah. definitely, <laughs> uh, you know, potential costly first iteration if we would have gone through and, and actually made the made the model into a physical prototype. So, Scott, I'll let you introduce yourself here. Yep, I'm Scott Woods, and I'm going to play the role as the uh, t pubs guy. And I'm going to be taking the design that uh, that Terrence and Andy is working on in, in parallel and create both the operation and assembly uh, instructions for them uh, using SolidWorks Composer. Awesome. So just to kind of give you, a, uh, those of you that are on, a little background. Uh, like I said, we you know just uh, chose a syringe model, you know, did some searching for medical products and started doing some research on syringes. and. Yeah, I, I learned a whole bunch about syringes. I mean, I was familiar leading up to this with just the, the real basic plunger, you know, stick the needle in whatever you're trying to inject, you know, fill the tube up, and then I obviously push that plunger down to um, expel a liquid. But as I started doing a lot more research, there's a ton of different designs out there that have uh, re retracting needle designs where the point of that is really to minimize, uh, ideally eliminate the um, contamination or exposure risk after that needle has been used. So, you know, the first thing I did was started doing research. And, you know, as you can see here, I just started essentially making a, a collage, a design board, picking cool images, um, watched more, more YouTube than, uh, than I'd like to admit, and uh, actually read through a couple patents. I hadn't done that in a long time, but um, even after looking at all these images, there's just so many different designs and a lot of times there's not enough detail to really, you know, fully understand what's, what's going on with that. And so, you know, I kind of chose the direction of, you know, I haven't designed anything really in a while. So I said, well, let's just, you know, maybe make our own design and we can tell a good story around that. And so, you know, to kick off any, any design, the way that I like to do it is typically just starting with some basic sketching techniques. And so, you know, uh, Tim Newton, my coworker, and I did a, a webinar at the beginning of 2021 on industrial equipment design. And we actually talked, had a whole section on the conceptual work that goes in before you get into modeling. Um, talked about some different sketching tools. Uh, some of my favorites, I've got my Wacom tablet sitting right in front of me. Not a great drawer, but it, it is really fun to use. And there are some benefits that you can realize with the enhancements in the software. So as you can see, you know, I just kind of started out with sketching um, some of these basic designs. And then really to, to start it off, to start moving into the 3D world, what I did was just design a real simple uh, syringe here. So just kind of to get a, a baseline, right? This is your standard standard plunger, no, no cool auto retract mechanism. 
Um, we've got that in PDM, so we're going to be working out a PDM that's going to be kind of our foundation uh, for all of the data. And as you can see here, I have a just a you know project folder structure set up, which you know has a mechanical design file, which has got all of my CAD data in it. So once I got that original design done, really the you know where we kick this off is creating a new project and. I know in previous companies I've made you know template folders where I copy paste and rename those in different locations and that can be kind of a pain. Um, working in the PDM professional, uh, there are template capabilities. So right within PDM, I can just simply right click. It'll present me with a data card that can contain you know whatever information that is relevant to the projects across the board. And once I populate that, you can see that it goes ahead and grabs the next serial number for that project. I don't need to track that stuff anywhere. It'll create the subfolder structure. So we're, you know, organized and uniform, you know, really across the organization. So people know where to go and find stuff if they need to find it. So after creating that first project, I'm kind of taking the method of uh, same but different. We always like to try to find a good starting point for our designs. And so you know, in the past, I've always you know opened up the model and done a save as, and then gone down to the part level and a save as, and a save as, and a save as, and that you know can get uh, very repetitive. And so, one thing, if you're not using it, I highly recommend looking into is the copy tree feature in uh, in PDM. And essentially, what that is is a, a souped up pack and go, right? Um, it allows you to you know select which components you want to create new ones of you can choose to include all of their drawings and do it in one big batch step um you know, i was i always make this joke i'm an engineer i'm not, not a clever guy when it comes to uh, documentation and so i absolutely love the serial number functionality inside of pdm and so what you can see i'm, I'm doing here is i'm just selecting all of these files and i'm just going to say grab the next serial number for each one of these and i don't have to worry about renaming them or anything else. Um, I'm going to save these into that new uh, project folder structure for the retractable syringe design. And uh, if I go browse up to that, you'll see that those files are now now contained in that in that folder. I don't have to worry about if I make any changes to it about messing up, you know, the the original syringe that's in production. So just eliminating all of the um, risk in terms of file management file management by leveraging that uh, that copy tree feature. Um, you know, I, as I said in the beginning, I'm not gonna go through the whole design, but I did kind of want to give you guys a, uh, a little overview of the direction that I went with this. So, you know, what I kind of chose was a, a snap clip mechanism. Um, this is actually the needle holder. So I was kind of envisioning the needle being, uh, or this component being over molded on top of that needle. And then as you can see, there's some, some flexible snap, I guess you could call them hinges in there where it'll seat into a grooved component on the nose of this assembly. And then when that plunger gets um, pushed all the way down to the bottom, there's a, a mating feature on there that'll actually compress each one of those tongs and, uh, and hopefully um, release it from that groove and allow that compressed spring to expand and then push the um, the needle as well as the assembly that it's attached to all back into the barrel, you know, eliminating that risk of contamination. And so, you know, going through this design, I know I take Terrence, um, you know, when I initially drew it up, I'm, I'm just throwing ballpark numbers out there and looking at it going, yeah, I think that'll work. That looks about right. And uh, really, it was a, a perfect use case for simulation. And so, you know, to kind of kick that off, instead of doing a, a pack and go or you know, emailing him the files, what I did was I, I built in a workflow into PDM that includes a state that's submitting it for analysis. And what I can do here is just simply take that top level assembly when it's to a point where, you know, might be good for a first pass simulation. Uh, I can right click on that and say, I want to submit this for analysis. I'm um, just putting a comment in there to to log what was done on that file and then i'm going to go ahead and notify um, as soon as this goes by real time terrence so that he knows that a simulation can be done as well as scott um, and you'll see it in a bit why we want to notify scott as he said earlier he's going to be doing the uh, assembly and operation documentation and leveraging some of the other software we're able to get a head start on that because it does retain all of those file links and references 
So when changes are made, um, you'll see some of the benefits when, when we get to his section there. Um, just to give you kind of some of the uh, background work that was done here, uh, for those of you that are using PDM, um, it's, it was extremely easy to set up and do. I just modified my CAD files workflow to add a, uh, an analysis, a simulation state. So instead of right away uh, submitting that for a review to do like a design review, I actually added a you know, simulation state in there where I have the ability to notify people one other thing that I did here was added a completely separate simulation workflow. So that's recognizing that there's a simulation folder under that project structure. And so any files that are created specifically for simulation aren't going to follow the typical production path. And so we want to make that much simpler for our analysis to use um, and stay working within the same system. Um, as we all know, I know I, I would if I was them. I, I did when I was in industry and I would typically save it to my desktop. I don't want to have to deal with these you know, potentially complex or time consuming processes that are in place. So something like this is really easy to implement and ensures that everybody is working out of the same system and is aware of, of what files are in there and what's going on when. Um, I guess one other thing is I've <laughs> put this together the other day. I guess I was having a good day. I decided to, uh, to kick Terrence's work off for him. Um, there's a really cool feature in PDM that was released a couple of years ago, uh, branch and merge. Typically it was, I think it was released initially for doing like conceptual work, right? Where we can branch off instead of doing a save as and replacing components or creating uh, a bunch of separate configurations. But what this branch and merge allows us to do is essentially create a branch or a connect, connected um, new data set to the original file. In this case, I'm using it for simulation. Um, simulation, uh, typically you do want to break that link. Terrence will cover a, a little bit more on that uh, and some of the benefits to it, um, specifically for pre-processing, breaking edges, making our model, uh, you know, good geometrically to be meshed, making sure we don't have overlapping regions or that clearances are set up correctly. And so really what I did here was just prepped him, uh, got him ready for being able to open up a model, make any design changes without actually modifying the original production models, in which case he can go through and make those changes, run the simulation, send it back to me. And, uh, you know, we'll, show you when it comes back around on how we can leverage that to update the production files. Neat to see, see you're part of the process here. You know, we, we worked on this together, but, uh, you know, I didn't get to start seeing it until you, you sent it over to me and I, I had the model. So, uh, you know, good to see, uh, you know, some of those conceptual drawings you had early on. Uh, I haven't seen those uh, before <laughs> this. That was, that was good. What was he thinking? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, I mean, you sent wow. this over to me and so you know I, I had the model that that you branched off and you you sent it over and um you know you were talking to me about this project and sort of the key thing that you're interested in learning more about was that um the snap hook features mm -hmm. um yeah uh so you you know um explain to me sort of how it worked and i'll take everybody through it again here just real quick you know when the plunger comes down uh you know you expel all that liquid at the end you give it that extra shove and then it's supposed to make that needle holder retract right by compressing those features and so in taking a closer look at it there are those four little snap hook you know fingers or whatever you want to call them and as that plunger comes in it's supposed to push those down and really what we were all worried about, you know, you and I were discussing, we we're wondering, you know, is this going to work? Is it not? We were really focused around this retaining feature in the groove there and whether you had picked the right dimensions for that and whether, you know, that would be able to release and allow for the spring to, to push that whole thing back into the syringe. And so, uh, you know, we figured some simulation would be a good way to figure that out. And, you know, we kind of had some not official but like bets on whether it would work or not i think you were a little more pro i was a little more apprehensive <laughs> um and i, I think both I of us were pretty good <laughs> yeah well i mean we were both totally wrong right we got totally surprised um but we'll get to that in a moment um now you touched on this already but i think it's important to you know talk about how we deal with simulation and pdm um 
you know, we've got a lot of customers that are using PDM, a lot of customers that are using different simulation tools, um, and a lot of customers that are using both together. Uh, I'd be curious to know from the audience here, you know, if you guys want to you know, add in some questions or chats, uh, you know, let us know, you know, are you using PDM, are you using simulation, are you using both, and, and how you work with it together. Um, but our recommendation um, for, for a long time now has been to break the link between these two things in some way. You know, Andy, you did that branch feature for me. So, you know, I had that model um, and that's a great way of doing it. Um, I've also, in a lot of cases, you know, somebody hands me some files from PDM and I just download them to a local copy and work on that to break the link or you know, get them to download it for me and, and email it to me or send it to me in some other way. Um, but I really like to have a separate simulation copy um, and that's for a number of reasons. Uh, the first one is you know, we often want to change the model in some way uh, for simulation. We're going to go and simplify, edit the model, you know, maybe get rid of some features, uh, cut it down into a quarter or a half for symmetry simplification. And as a simulation user, I am always a little bit worried about ruining the actual manufacturing model. Um, you know, there are ways we can be very careful with configurations and take care of that, but it's a little nerve wracking to think that I could ruin it for everyone else that's working off that model in PDM just by clicking on the wrong thing. And so I do like to have a separate copy. Uh, the other thing is when I'm done and I have the results, we often talk about how do we record that? How do we save that information? Um, and the first thought would be to save the results files back to PDM, but we actually usually recommend that against that as well. Um, for one, they can be really large, and so you're taking up a lot of server space, potentially. Uh, and probably more importantly, they don't really contain the information that you need to record. Right, if I save that giant result file back, it is only really useful for somebody that has a simulation license and knows how to interpret the results. And so it's actually much more useful if I can somehow document the information of the simulation in another way. Right, We want to document what type of test I did, what the setup details were, uh, any assumptions I made, you know, what the results were, you know, maybe some key screenshots or key animations would be more useful than an entire results file pack. And then if I have any recommendations, I definitely want to be able to capture that as well. And okay. so I, reckon, I, just, yeah. I just wanted to jump in there on, on your first bullet point, you made a comment that you actually like uh, working with a separate data set. That's why I like working with you. I know a lot of people are, uh, they really want to get their hands on, on the actual engineering data set, which does pose a lot of risk, right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes depending on the design intent of how that file was drawn, they might not fully understand where relationships are and making changes to some of those critical dimensions or things that shouldn't be changed that they might be unaware of really does pose a lot of risk. So breaking Absolutely. that off is extremely important. Yeah, it can be a little scary to edit someone else's model if you're not going to take the time to really understand, you know, um, later on, you know, you'll see in this process, I did edit your model, Andy, and uh, I could see that when I was editing the holder, like some of like the groove features and the other parts were like changing as well, and I was a little bit scared, you know, I told you about that when I sent it back and, and let you do with that what you, what you wanted to, but it, you know, it's nice knowing that I was changing and playing around with it, but I wasn't ruining something that you had been working on for a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, my recommendation and our recommendation, rather than trying to you know, work on the live model and save all your simulation results up there is to you know, take it offline, do your analysis, and then document it with some sort of report. Um, you know, this can be something really official that you write up, or it can be something really casual. I have often used you know, a PowerPoint presentation with some animations dropped in as a report, you know, just some key values typed in, um, whatever it is. But we recommend using something non-simulation as the, the information base. And that's really helpful. You know, if anybody comes back in the future and wants to review what was done and you know, look into PDM to see why did this change, they can pull up that report and they don't have to have a simulation license. They don't have to be a simulation expert. They can understand what was done, why it was done, and what we learned from it. Uh, so we find that's a much better way to record simulation in PDM. Uh, so getting back to the, the project at hand, um, I did have this separate branch copy, so I was able to go and just start hacking away at it. Um, I still like to create simulation configurations. Um, 
just so that if I do need to go back to the full, I can. And so I take, took the plunger there, I lopped off a big chunk of it, I got rid of these threads uh, on the barrel, and then I suppressed a whole bunch of the other components of the syringe, because I really only needed the plunger, the little key holder piece in the barrel. And so I had this simplified simulation version. Uh, from here, um, went into my simulation software to run this. And I do want to talk a little bit about you know, picking a simulation software. Uh, we have a bunch of different simulation tools that we work with here at Hawkridge. Uh, you know, we have SolidWorks Simulation, which is great for some you know, real uh, uh, early on analysis uh, for, for simple linear problems. Uh, for this one, we're getting into quite a non-linear problem. So I went for, for a different tool. Um, again, we have some different options there, but for this particular one, um, I chose the Simulia Structural Performance Engineer tool. Uh, which is on the 3D Experience cloud platform. Uh, I'll go through the reasons why I chose this tool for this project uh, when we look at the setup. Uh, but because it is a cloud platform, the first thing I had to do was go and import my SolidWorks file into the 3D Experience. Um, so I'm you know, browsing out on the computer, choosing the file and uploading it. Uh, the nice thing here is I am doing this in a linked way. So if I go and change my SolidWorks model, we can update the cloud version pretty easily. and You'll see that later on. Uh, so we've got it in this 3D experience tool uh, and I'm gonna go through the setup that I used. Uh, some of the key things uh, were of course assigning the materials. So I assigned stainless steel to the barrel and then the plunger and the key part, the holder with the snap hook arms, uh, those I used an ABS material out of my library. I had suppressed the spring model that Andy created. Instead, I'm using a spring connector definition in the simulation. Uh, this is nice because I'm actually able to go and assign the stiffness as well as a reference length so that I can account for the fact that this is a pre-compressed spring, right? It's installed compressed and that way, once that snap hook releases, that, that whole part can, can head back into the syringe and retract the needle. Uh, now, I talked about choosing this particular tool for a few reasons. Uh, the first was I wanted access to the Abacus Solver. Uh, so this Structural Performance Engineer tool does use the Simulia Abacus Solver, uh, which is particularly well suited for this analysis because it's a really robust nonlinear solver, and it's also set up for multi-step analysis. And so I created two analysis steps here. The first one is a nonlinear static step. And that's to allow that spring to seat, um, you know, take that retaining feature, seat it into the groove and have that pretension developed. And then in step two, I used a nonlinear dynamic step to bring that plunger in because once those snap hooks compress enough uh, and that spring pops out, that is gonna be a fairly you know, fast action. That thing's gonna wanna pop out and wanna capture that dynamic behavior. Another reason for choosing this tool was to be able to take advantage of the contact solving. It's got really robust nonlinear contact solving, and I get to define that with a general contact feature. Uh, in this case, I included a little bit of friction, uh, but the real benefit here in using general contact is I don't have to predict all the different faces that are going to make contact with each other. Um, saves me a lot of time for this project and you know saves even more time I'm sure you can imagine if you have uh, an analysis where maybe hundreds or thousands of faces come into contact with each other uh, to round out the setup i took that face uh, where the threads were on the barrel and i fixed those to lock that down uh, and then we have the plunger with an applied displacement moving that plunger in uh, to simulate sort of that last little click after we're done um, applying the the medicine or vaccine or whatever's in this syringe. So with the setup done, of course we can go and simulate the analysis. Uh, and the last reason that I picked this tool for this particular project was it gives you the ability to either run the simulation and calculate using your computer or using the 3D Experience cloud servers. Uh, and at the time that you asked me to work on this, Andy, I actually had a few other things on the go that I was using my computer for. And so I picked this so that I would be able to run on cloud. And um, you know, while this thing was running, I was able to go and continue with my other projects. I wasn't tying up my machine. Um, 
So that, that's probably the, the biggest reason I picked this tool for this particular project. Don't tell your boss that though, right? You're working on this real hard always. Yeah, <laughs> probably, took, right. probably took all afternoon. <laughs> yeah, all afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I went away, I did my, my other work or had a beer or whatever it was, and uh, I, I came back and it actually turned out that my first run through this analysis, it, it failed, it, it stopped partway through. And what we're looking at right now, these were the partial results that we got. Uh, and it stopped and failed because um, something pretty surprising. The four little snap hook arms they actually ran into each other. And uh, you can see here that as they run into each other, uh, obviously they can't compress anymore. And when we zoom in on that, uh, we can see that that's not quite going to work. That uh, snap hook isn't quite getting the clearance to to move into that plunger cavity. And you know that was surprising. You know, both you and I, Andy, we were both so focused on that groove and the retaining feature. I I didn't even consider this as a possibility of the. Yeah, the this, this this really took me off guard. I was you know concerned about that wall thickness and how flimsy that was going to be, and you know just at, at first glance looking at it from a side view, would never have guessed that you know we wouldn't have had enough clearance you know between the ends of the tongs. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you know it's a great thing about simulation is you often learn things you you weren't expecting to learn. So. Um, it's nice to have that and, and learn that. And then we talked about you know ways to fix this. And I went off and made some edits in SolidWorks. Um, so you know Andy sort of gave me permission to hack away at his model a little bit and see what I could do to, to resolve that. And so I started changing some of the dimensions. Uh, I reduced the, the height of the snap hook a little bit, changed that retaining feature just a touch and uh, reduce the thickness of the arm to make it flex a little bit more easily. And then probably the most important thing was I changed the cut that you had created uh, between those four finger features, made it a little bit larger to give them a bit more clearance. And you know, hopefully that way the ends wouldn't run into each other is what I was thinking. Uh, and so on the right side of the screen there, you can see what the design looked like before, and this is what it looked like after. And so before, and after a uh, pretty subtle change, but you know we were, we thought that would probably be enough because we weren't that far off on the first try. Uh, you, you did pretty good, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, once we've got it changed in SolidWorks, uh, we can bring that across to that cloud platform for the Simulia tool. You know, I mentioned it's a linked version, uh, so all you have to do is once you save it in SolidWorks, uh, is go back to the 3D experience tool, and there is a hidden SolidWorks update button. And this will allow it to detect whether changes have been made to your model, and if so, it will bring in those models. Uh, you'll see it'll take a moment to bring them in, reference them. You'll see the mesh will actually disappear and then reappear, so it is going to automatically remesh the new geometry. And it's going to keep all of my boundary conditions and my loads and the steps that I created. So I don't really have to redo any setup. I can just go and run the simulation again. And again, I calculated on cloud so that I could you know, keep doing my other projects, ran the results. Uh, and then this time, when I came back to look at the results, uh, things were looking a bit better. And we can see that it actually compresses those snap hooks enough that they clear. And so that retaining feature comes out of the groove and that spring connector that I created is able to force that whole holder back into the syringe. So, you know, it bring that needle back with it. So. Um, yeah, being able to see that, that uh, dynamic effect of the spring activated, activating, that, uh, that was really impressive to me. That's even fun of that. Yeah, and so you know, all that was left at this point was to document what I had done in simulation. Um, you know, I, I showed Andy an animation of this, but then I also took some screenshots, put this into a report, wrote up you know my recommendations, and probably most importantly, wrote down the dimensional changes that I had made so that Andy could could go and do that on his end. Um, so I took that report saved it into PDM and Andy has the choice you know he can go and edit his original model or I, I did you know edit that branch version so if he likes the way I made the changes of course he could go and 
uh, merge that back into his design with that branch and merge feature. Uh, and that's up to him. Yeah, awesome. Really appreciate that, Terrence. Like I said, that was uh, super impressive. That first design that, you know, even uh, I know I modified it a couple of times myself and thought, yeah, this has got to be pretty close. This will work. Um, really surprised by by seeing those tongs, uh, you know, with that self contact. Not something I would have expected. No, nope. yeah, surprised me for sure. Awesome. So, um, kind of moving on, you know, as I said initially, that branch and merge feature was one where you can can take that off, and here's really where you see the benefit of that. You know, Terrence went ahead and made those changes and modified, you know, the simulation of that branch, giving him the flexibility to do that without, you know. Um, screwing up the production model. And so when you use this feature, you do have the ability, I can come back in, you know, let me know that that's been done. I can review it and then just, you know, simply selecting it and saying merge that back into the original file will uh, we'll do just that. So you can see as I browse back to my original mechanical design files, my production files, selecting on that original component, I can view the history of it. And that's going to show me, um, you know, when that merge was done, that that merge was done, giving me that that full audit trail or the life of the development of that product. So for any of you that need to, you know, um, meet certain uh, regulations um, uh, for any type of standards, you know, this is typically what's going to be required. And, and that uh, feature fully allows you to do that. So the next uh, next thing we need to do here is to uh, one submit this for review. I've got my workflow set up, so you know I've I've gone ahead as a designer and updated my model with those changes. Probably a, a good next step here before we fully release this into production is to sit down, have a design review with uh, all involved parties, um, just to make sure everybody's on board that we're good to get this out, get it manufactured. So I'll go ahead and uh, submit this for a review, uh, request a design review meeting, notify, um, you know, Terrence and Scott, as well as uh, I guess anybody else that uh, it would make sense. And then um, once I have that complete, then uh, we do that design review, we all decide that, that we're good to go, then I'm gonna do the final release on this. And so this is kind of gonna wrap up the mechanical design side of it, the simulation side of it, now, one thing that I am going to do here is I'm going to notify Scott. I'm going to let him know. If you remember earlier on, um, you know, I let him know that, hey, we've got a concept uh, complete here. We're going to move that into simulate or move it into simulation. So you can probably, you know, get started on some of the documentation. But, uh, you know, now I'm letting him know that, hey, we're wrapped up. You go ahead and, and run and do whatever you need to to uh, to get that assembly and the operation instructions done. So with that, I'll hand it over to Scott. All righty. Thanks, Andy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I'm over here in the, the tech pubs department and, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on over there in engineering and most of the time I don't have to. Um, and that's really a, a beauty about, uh, about Composer that I can work in parallel when that design is still being uh, developed and I can start my portion of the documentation before that's, uh, before that's complete. Um, I'm going to show that here in a second. Uh, before I jump into that, I, I want to just talk just a minute on, on what is SolidWorks Composer for any of, any of you that uh, uh, might be new to this uh, to this tool. Um, it is a authoring application, and it's designed to make really uh, robust image, imagery and animation. It takes your SolidWorks CAD models, and really, I mean, any CAD model. If it's if it's in 3D, you can get it into Composer. Um, uh, your 2D images, uh, you can bring in video content, even uh, even vector content. You compile all that together. You create you create the step by step assembly instructions. You create uh, operation, maintenance manuals, and um, yeah, it's really a like all around uh, document doc documentation tool uh, that really focuses on creating that imagery and video that can be used in something like a Word doc or uh, InDesign or anything like that. And uh, that brings me to what, what I created here. So as uh, Andy and Terrence are figuring out the uh, the final design, uh, I inside a composer, I create my build materials, uh, a bunch of images for both operation and assembly of this product. I exported those images as, as JPEGs, brought that into uh, Microsoft Word uh, to compile it together, add some text, 
and then on the, and then also in Composer, you can do animation, which you see on the right here, uh, created some nice uh, animations of this going together. Now, when I say, you know, I there's changes, right? And I don't really need to, I mean, I'm part of the design review process and I'll find out what those changes are, but um, really, I don't need to know what's going to change in order to start my documentation. But once I know the changes are been done, I come here and I see, yeah, I'm, I'm missing some threads. I'm looking at this spring thinking, you know, this really, it, it's, it's compressed. It should not be in a compressed state because we compress it during assembly. So little things like that, uh, missing an annotation here on the head assembly. And, you know, I, I didn't finish this documentation and I didn't have to at this stage. Just, you know, you get it to a certain point. So, okay, the design has changed, missing a balloon here um, on the plunger. And so now I know, okay, I need to go back into Composer. I need to update from that latest design and then uh, then clean up this document and, and wrap it up. So here we are in uh, the Composer, Sol Solver's Composer software. It's fully integrated with, with PDM. There's actually an add-in in Composer to connect, the, connect your Composer documentation to PDM. And uh, if you own both Composer and PDM, um, you already have this, this add-in. Now, one really important thing to point out here is that when I pull that design from PDM into Composer, it's making a copy of it. So I'm going to go and do that here. And anything I do in Composer is not going to affect SolidWorks whatsoever. So just like Andy and Terrence are working on their, their different you know, um, copies of the document, this works the same way of the design, I should say. Uh, because the composer does it automatically. So it imports the, comp the solver's content and, and that lives as a copy inside of composer. And you can see we have uh, the updated, once we updated uh, composer with the final design here. But um, anything I do in the software is not gonna go back and modify that design. So it protects the design, but it still allows mm -hmm. me to get into PDM, get what I need, without uh, making any changes that uh, I shouldn't be making. Okay, um, so now let's go ahead and make those changes in Composer. First thing I wanna do is I need to decompress this spring. And in, in uh, you know, best case scenario, that would be a configuration in SolidWorks. I just show that configuration in Composer, be done with it. That wasn't the case here, so I actually had to stretch it. Uh, it doesn't look absolutely perfect, but it gets the point across, and that's really the point of this kind of software where we're just trying to say, hey, we need to uh, get the point across. It needs to be simple. It needs to be you know, uh, language-free and the ability to uh, update that. Um, next is annotation. So in, in Composer, we can add uh, annotations to anything. Uh, by default, that will point to something like metadata. So, uh, so any, any of that um, content that exists inside of SolidWorks and uh, but we can also, you know, type yeah, in that, like a string that's of data. Like where, you, where you have your data cards, right, in PDM, and you define all of that met metadata, all those properties that are associated with that CAD file. You know, you do that to populate the bill of materials, but it also, you know, as Scott said, it's a, you know, a roadway, a street over to Composer where we can now extract any of that information and, and pull that into our models and our um, drawing views. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, so we repurpose that metadata and Composer is all about repurposing. So we can, you know, add annotations or balloons to re reference metadata. Um, anything done in Composer, you don't lose. So if you bring in like something like this, like I created a balloon, I can repurpose that balloon and any of these other steps that don't have that balloon. It's not like PowerPoint where if you delete something, it deletes it, you know, from the entire document. That's not how this works. It just deletes it from that certain step but still lives in the document. So if I have an image, uh, metadata, balloons, you know, annotations, any of that stuff, I can repurpose it. And that really is the, the point of Composer in order to take that data and reuse it. Okay, so now that I have updated my steps in Composer, it's time to, uh, to publish out the images. So the Word document that I have is actually linking to these images. And so if I replace the images, the Word document is automatically updated and it creates a really solid workflow. So I can take this composer document that you know, had all my previous steps, 
there were some design changes, went through, I said, okay, let's go ahead and update this with all my design changes uh, that Andy and Terrence made there. Um, I don't even have to know what those are, right? The software knows. Um, and I just uh, uh, rendered them out as the series of images. It overwrites all the previous images. I can store this in the vault or outside the vault. Uh, it's, it's up to the current workflow, uh, however you want to do that. And by replacing those images, then that Word document that I have will then be updated. And it's as simple as reopening up the Word document and all of those images are updated with those latest designs and anything that I did like stretching out that spring, uh, the the uh, annotation and the uh, that 07 um, balloon that I added to the plunger. So it's, um, it's a super easy way to update that documentation and then export that as like a PDF, that's my controlled document. So now in the future, I would rev that document. Uh, if there was any more design changes, update Composer, bam, back through Word, create another document for another revision. Kind of so, like a SolidWorks part feature tree, right? You make a change to exactly. uh, one of the earlier features and all the other ones still propagate and update based off of that earlier change. Yep, exactly. And that's the idea here, right? Where everything is linked together, you're not redoing uh, steps, you're not recreating content, you're just repurposing what's there. You got all that great data from SolidWorks, you have other assets that you're referencing images and text and you know, um, you compile all that, that together and you create this documentation. Uh, and the last thing I wanna talk about here is that Composer doesn't only do all the steps of the process, but also does animation. And you'll see here is that older version of the syringe and i'll go ahead and update it here for uh for the design changes that also completely updates the animation and i really wanted to point this out because if you've ever done animation in the past you know that it it can be a pain right you you uh, you have all these keyframes and you're trying to update uh, geometry and data and, and and then your grouping doesn't stick and things start flying apart and you have to restart half the time where in in composer your your steps of the process are connected to your CAD files, and then your animation is connected to that those steps within Composer. So you update the design, the steps update, and then since the animation is looking at the steps, it updates too. So it creates this really seamless workflow, and it's it's really really slick, um, and hands down the easiest animation software to update once there is a design change. Yeah, Scott, I know you and I both have been playing around with. Uh some of the Adobe products, and I've also used PhotoView and some of the SolidWorks Motion in the past, and um, keyframing gets extremely complex very quickly. <laughs> yep, yeah, you yeah. get all these, these yep. levels, and then you absolutely take a, take a couple of days you know, off of it, and you come back to it, and it's like, what am I looking at? <laughs> just just yep. keyframes. Yep. Compose are just a simple right-click, update, and everything, everything updates accordingly. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, just a, a quick session for you here, guys, today. Um, appreciate you joining. If you do have questions, there hasn't been much much chatter, we'll uh, we'll stick around. But that's kind of what we had put together for you. Um, you know, we talked about some of the CAD design. We hit on PDM, some of the features that you can leverage in there to, you know, automate some of those mundane tasks to um, create some iterations doing conceptual design as well as leverage the branch and merge feature which was initially for conceptual design for something like simulation you know, that was one that just kind of popped into my head when I was putting this together and really it does work fantastic um, and we moved over into Terrence hitting on uh, some of the abacus tools getting into that nonlinear simulation and validating that design before you know investing in uh, some of those potentially expensive prototypes um, really, really took, I think, both of us off guard. It was not expecting a failure like that, but we were able to identify that uh, early on and uh, and make adjustments accordingly. And then, you know, while we were all doing that, you know, Scott was able to come up with some initial documentation using some of those prototype models when they were fully released, come back, come back around and update it. You know, really all working from that single source of truth, that production CAD model, you know, through the entire process. So, like I said, if you uh, have any questions, we'll stick around here for a little bit. Um, you know, really, we wanted to show how how the products can integrate together and how they do play together, and uh, you know, work you know really really seamlessly in parallel to deliver you know a product, new product design from you know a concept 
through the final states. Um, I think if you guys have seen any of our other webinars, you've seen this slide before, we do offer a, a lot of different products and there is a lot more integration that can happen between them. So if you guys are curious about that stuff, this is, I think I, I know what I love doing. Um, Terrence and Scott get into it quite a bit as well is figuring out what is that best workflow? How do we set this up so that we don't have gaps or so we're not creating duplicate files so that we have you know, a real robust production environment. So again, thanks for joining. Other than that, have a good rest of the day.